Hey, I'm Justin, and this is The Art of Repair. On today's episode of The Art of Repair, we'll be answering one of the most fundamental questions in the rework community. What in the heck do I set my hot air station to to do a specific job? Actually though, let's take a step back and look at the question and see if we can't rework it a bit to make it the correct question to ask. As the first thing I'm going to let you know is that there is no set way to do every job. I know it's a big play on words with the channel here, but there really is an art form to rework. It's very easy to see this with the multitude of new techs entering the fray and posting videos online, which in itself can be a pretty confusing thing to watch if you're not really sure yourself and you're watching people that are doing more of a documentation of their own work as opposed to just teaching directly. The correct question to ask would be, what variables do you need to look at to determine the correct settings for your own personal technique and of course, why? So now that we have the correct question, I'm going to go ahead and go over a few things that you should pay attention to while you're doing your own rework. And also a few key fundamental concepts that will help you understand it better. Now, be aware, all of this may seem very overwhelming at first, but over time I hope that you see the benefits of paying attention to these small details as they will build into solid intuition, which of course will carry you through a lifetime of work. So let's go ahead and dive right in and talk thermodynamics. Everyone's always afraid of the engineering side of things in this field, and it's pretty much the number one reason why people don't give it a chance. But rest assured, knowledge is power, and I believe in you, even if you don't. So, if this is what scares you, pause the video now, take a deep breath, and when you're ready, hit play, and I will do my absolute best to help you understand in such a way that it all starts to make sense. Now, there are three laws of thermodynamics the first of which would be the law of conservation of energy and mass. This first law of thermodynamics, in a nutshell, states that you cannot create nor destroy energy. Now, how does that directly apply to rework? It relates in the fact that as you work with the board, you'll be introducing thermal energy in the form of hot convected air over a short distance directly to a target component, and by proxy, the surrounding components. It means that the energy you put in must go somewhere and that somewhere is your entire workpiece, with the epicenter being your target component. Now, the second law of thermodynamics states that energy from a lower energy state cannot be transferred to a higher energy state without some sort of outside work. In the case of rework, this means that all the energy that you introduce into the system, your workpiece, will radiate out from the target component to anything surrounding it by means of either direct thermal conduction or through thermal radiation. In layman's terms, if you heat something up, it will heat up the things that it touches or the things that it's in close proximity to, to try and reach an equilibrium in its own system toward the temperature that you apply. Now, there is a third law of thermodynamics, but as it relates to rework, it's more of just a basic guide to remind you of what's going down with your rework. The third law of thermodynamics states that as temperature reaches absolute zero, entropy slows and eventually ceases. What's that mean? How does that have anything to do with a hot air gun? Well, it does, and it doesn't. Like I mentioned, it's more of a grand scheme type of thing for what we're trying to do. It just reminds us that you are doing something at a subatomic level to your workpiece. As you heat things up and introduce thermal energy into the system, which is your workpiece, it is causing things to heat up and speed up. So this law should be more interpreted in the opposite direction. It's a sign that says, hey, if things cool down, they'll be more stable. As you heat things up though, they'll become unstable. As things become unstable, they break down through thermal expansion or contraction based on the core material's breakdown temperature. So now look at that. We made it through all three laws of thermodynamics and it wasn't even that bad. Pretty easy, right? Speaking of breakdown temperature, sometimes it's better to tell someone what they cannot do over telling them what to do. Part of learning is inferring knowledge and bridging your own gaps through other people's interpretations. So I'm gonna go ahead and tell you right now that if you fully saturate an IC chip to anything close to 400C, you're probably gonna hose it. We're working with nanometer transistors that can experience full breakdown and warping at such extremes. I know some of your hot air stations reach higher than 400C, but that doesn't mean you should subject your work to that type of energy or stress. While there are still direct uses for higher temperature settings like EMI removal, always remember that less is more and visual cues will build your intuition. So pay attention to your work. Remember, the first law of thermodynamics states that energy has to go somewhere. 
and it's going to go into your board and all other adjacent components. All right, so let's get in there and talk about these variables. There are tool side variables, which include nozzle diameter, airflow, temperature, heat sinking, and distance. Then we also have workpiece variables like mass of work, solder type, component breakdown temperature, neighboring components, and insulation. Let's take a look at the workpiece variables first so we can see the intricacies and their relationships. The first thing we will look at is the mass of work of a particular component. The actual physical mass of your target component will give you a good idea of how much energy needs to go into the board for rework. If you have a smaller component, you may not need to introduce as much energy into the board to release it. Having less mass to heat up means less energy needed to reach the target joint temperature. While if you have a large IC chip, it may require a bit more energy to be removed. The goal here is to saturate the component until its joints are past their eutectic state, which is the state at which your solder is both a solid and a liquid. And speaking specifically for WeWork, a virgin board will always be assembled with ROHS lead-free solder. This is also a reason why people pull pads. They feel the chip or component move, and it's only actually partially released because it's still in that eutectic state. This means if we look at the second law of thermodynamics again and apply it to this, as you heat the actual component itself, the heat will transfer to the lower energy state part of the system from the higher energy state part of the system as it reaches equilibrium in the PCB and your joint. So as you heat the IC chip, it heats up and heat sinks to the board. As you introduce more heat to the target component, it will reach an equilibrium between the component, its surrounding components in the system. And the connection of this would be the BGA array itself or the S&D solder joints, which is our true target. The true target of your rework is the solder joint itself because that's what you're trying to release. Speaking of solder joints, this would be a great time to go over solder types as well as their part in the process. There are a few types of solder that you will encounter regularly in rework. The first would be the one that I've already mentioned, which would be lead-free ROHS. Lead-free ROHS solder is industry standard for use in mobile electronics. Now I'm not going to sit here and tell you all the different temperatures at which solder melts because it's kind of irrelevant in the grand scheme. You'll never really be able to tell exactly what temperature your joint is at since your thermal energy is in a constant state of flux within the individual thermal system, which would be your workpiece. But I will give you a range and an idea of what direction to go. I have not personally seen lead-free solder that doesn't melt prior to 230 degrees centigrade, with leaded usually melting mm, 40 to 50 degrees earlier. Then we get into low melt alloys that can not only melt at temperatures closer to 130 C period, but they are capable of maintaining their wet states up to almost 30 seconds as opposed to mere seconds of lead-free and regular 6040 or 6337 solder. So once again, we are looking at a temperature that's almost half that of the critical 400 degrees centigrade that I mentioned earlier. Now, it's important to know here that we are not discussing soldering irons. This is an entirely different video on its own that I will cover at a later date. We are currently talking about convection of hot air to a board, which is more of a broad stroke paintbrush heating versus a precision application of heat like a soldering iron provides. Something else important to note here and take account of is the component type and its neighboring components. Every single component has its own breakdown temperature and it's a good idea to go ahead and research all of this. While most components can easily make it through rework, there will be times where you can destroy the component you are trying to work on with heat. Some things to watch out for are plastic components or molded components, as these can easily experience thermal expansion, contraction, or good old-fashioned warping and become useless, especially if you're trying to use them as donor components. While we are talking about component breakdown temperatures, let's also realize that since we now know that a hot air gun is more of a broad stroke approach, this thermal energy is going to be spread out to neighboring components just as it's going to spread through a target component. Heat transfers through a board just as fast as it will transfer out from the target center's location. This perfectly leads into insulation and proper heat sinking. While you are working on these devices, you will undoubtedly break something on accident. Everyone who has learned PCB rework has damaged something on the other side of the board. It can be as simple as a quick reflow of a small SD component on the other side of the board to a total CPU catastrophe where you reflow the CPU and short it out. A big part of your rework will be protecting other components. This comes in two ways, insulation and heat sinking. Insulation is the last workpiece variable we will look at, as it in itself will lead into heat sinking, which will begin our tool side variables. So we all know what insulation is, but what does it mean in relation to our rework? Insulation could be either a good thing or a bad thing depending on the situation. 
An example of bad insulation would be our earlier talks of shorting out a CPU or other components opposite side of the PCB due to the fact that the heat has traversed through the PCB itself to the other side. An unfortunate situation could arise for anyone who is not removing the EMI shield on the opposite side of the board because we all know that air gaps are insulators. So unless you are doing a small job that doesn't require a tremendous amount of thermal energy, it's probably best to remove opposing EMI shields to heat sink your board. Now, not all of them, just the ones opposite your work. Now, over time, you'll find your own rhythm, and this will not always be necessary. As you practice more, the energy you put into the board will be more focused and deliberate as opposed to when you first started, which is another big reason you can't just follow the settings of someone who is exponentially more experienced than you. They already have intangible, unteachable experience in their hands. A side note here, some EMI shields require absorbent amounts of heat to remove and are attached to the board with high temp solder to prevent removal. Always research a board prior to just going at it on this, as it may be more work and more dangerous to remove some of these EMI shields than possibly damaging something by, you know, just a little bit of insulated heat. Insulation also has a good side to it. It's a dual variable, really, meaning it's something that you not only need to watch out for, but it's something that you can use to your advantage. Everyone has seen the magic golden tape that everyone uses on their work. This is called capped on tape. It's a polyamide tape used for thermal protection. If you cover all the areas around your target component, it's not that it will prevent all the heat from entering the system, but it will prevent a good amount of energy from transferring directly to that portion of your work as you direct thermal energy to the component. It's also great to use when you're new and you're doing smaller S and D components by protecting the area from too much airflow, which I'm sure some of you know will blow away some of your components. So, so we have talked about the good and the bad sides of insulation. Let's really hit these tool side variables now. So what can we do to prevent overheating to sensitive areas of our work? I know you've already thought about it in your head. That's right, heat sinking. The same concept used to cool down your CPU on your computer can be used during your rework to prevent damage to sensitive components. There are many ways you can heat sink your work. I personally have an entire drawer full of different sized metals in different sizes and thicknesses that I can use to wedge under the board, but a simple handful of coins can be just as, if not more useful in a pinch just to get started. To properly heat sink your work, it's crucial to remove the air gap associated with insulation. So after you've cleared out a path to your work, make sure that your heat sink, whatever you choose it to be, is making direct contact with your thermal system. The workpiece, with the epicenter being the sensitive component itself, this will draw out some of the energy that has to go somewhere. That's the first and second law again there, folks. Y'all starting to see a trend here? Now, just to be clear and to reiterate this one more time, you will not always need to heat sink things. And things that you heat sinked prior, you may come to find that you don't need as time goes on. But it's always good to understand the value of such things. If you ever find yourself in mission critical situations where you cannot afford to goof up, heat sinks where it's at. Anyway, let's keep moving this forward. The next few tool side variables are gonna be pretty easy at this point. The key is to make sure you analyze your job before you begin, and to not forget that you can change things as you go along. Like I explained before, rework is not exact and it never will be. As long as there's a human hand doing the work, it's generally a pretty unique experience per person. So now it's time to decide on what to do with these tool side variables. We have nozzle diameter, which we can just call the focus of the energy. The smaller the diameter of your nozzle, the more focused the hot air will be. The thermal energy output will be the same regardless of the tip, hence why I stated it's focused. As long as you have a decent hot air station, you will always have a laminar flow, which is a straight, parallel stream. If you have a lower quality station, it's possible to notice small, turbulent, circular hot air eddies, indicating you have turbulent flow. This can be observed by putting a smaller diameter nozzle on your gun and turning your hot air to its highest air flow setting and its lowest temperature setting, so you can feel it on your hands without burning yourself. If you notice pouts of air versus a solid stream, it's time to move to a new station, as the airflow dynamics internally are not good quality and will 100% influence the quality of your work in a negative way. Usually you find this on lower quality stations that have fans built into the handle, but I have noticed it on nicer units only because I checked. Next, we will look at temperature and then airflow. Now, since I've gone over a few critical temperatures earlier, you should be able to infer at this point at least what temperature to attempt to repair at. As a recap though, if solder wets regardless by 250 degrees centigrade and IC chips experience transistor breakdown and warping around 400 degrees centigrade and you have researched breakdown temperatures for other components, you should be able to infer a good starting temperature. 
Remember, the target goal is the solder joint. Just remember your second law of thermodynamics and you will be fine. This is the same for airflow. At this point, airflow is just the intensity of the amount of heat that you're going to push out. If you notice yourself in a situation where you need less heat to prevent damage, use less. If you're in a situation where you reach a target temperature for removal, then add more. This is an easy one, not a big deal here. But now, we've come to pretty much the most important variable in hot air rework, and that's distance. Distance is what really throws everything out of whack, and truthfully, it's what makes the actual temperature you select on your station more of like a general guide than an exact temperature. If we go back a little bit and look at Newton's law of cooling, which states that the rate of temperature change is directly proportional to the ambient temperature of the transfer medium, then it's easy to understand why this not only happens, but why it's very important to at least just be aware of this specific law of physics. Now, I'm not gonna whoop out a bunch of math on you here because that's the last thing everybody wants, but rest assured, it's definitely easy to lose heat from your temperature sensor to your workpiece. The farther you are away, the more heat you will lose. Now that we've gone over the variables used to determine what settings to use for your hot air, I hope this will help you reach the next level in your rework game. Remember, do not let it overwhelm you and understand that very quickly this information will turn into solid intuition and you will not even have to think about it anymore. So anyway, it's that time again. Don't forget to like, subscribe, leave some comments down below, and keep learning. Once again, I'm Justin, and this is The Art of Repair.